First of all, welcome to the Scoot Ruggers Undergraduate Pedagogy Seminar. I'm the host of the opening ceremony of this conference, Xiang Cong, Director of the Academic Affairs Office and Director of the Office of Teaching and Global Affairs of South China University of Technology. This seminar is a great chance for us to continue to deepen exchanges and cooperation between the two universities since the epidemic prevention and control became normal. The school sees great importance to the seminar, and Vice President Li Weiqing, who is also in charge of foreign affairs, took time to attend the meeting. Today, I'm very happy to invite teachers and guests from various universities, such as South China University of Technology, Rutgers University, Central University of Finance and Economics, Southern University of Science and Technology, and Chinese University of Hong Kong in Shenzhen. Here, I would like to extend a warm welcome and a sincere thanks to all the guests present. Uh, the conference is divided into two parts, the opening ceremony and the teaching exchange session. Vice President Li Weiqing and Vice President Eric Garfunkel will give opening speeches respectively. The teaching exchange meeting will be hosted by Dr. Du Fan, Deputy Director of the International Office of Rutgers University. Seven faculty representatives from Scoot and Rutgers will share their teaching experience. After the exchange, China and the United States will each have 10 minutes of discussion and question and answer sessions, while Assistant Vice President Wang Jianfeng of Rutgers University will deliver a closing speech. Next, let us invite Dr. Wei Ching Li, Vice President of South China University of Technology, to give an opening speech. Let's welcome. 尊敬的Eric校长,各位老师和各位同仁,大家早上好。Dear President Garfunkel, teachers and colleagues, good morning everyone. 非常感谢各位在百忙之中抽出时间来参加本次华南理工大学罗格斯大学课堂教学经验交流的线上研讨会。我仅代表华南理工大学向所有出席本次会议的中外嘉宾表示欢迎和诚挚的感谢。Thank you very much for taking the time out of your busy schedule to participate in the first year pedagogy discussion seminar between South China University of Technology and Rutgers University. On behalf of South China University of Technology, I would like to extend my welcome and a sincere appreciation to all Chinese and foreign guests attending this meeting. Lugasudashia South China University of Technology is one of the first 36 double first class universities in China. Rutgers University is also a world renowned top public research university. The two universities have started degree programs, cooperative scientific research, and faculty exchange since 2011 for 10 years. 
Even the new COVID, even the new COVID nineteen epidemic has not been able to stop the pace of in depth cooperation between the two universities. Ariv 副校长在二零二零年十二月已经到访了华工，我们也见了面，为罗格斯大学海外教学的基地揭牌。这也成为新冠肺炎疫情进入常态化防控阶段以来首位来访的国外高校的代表。罗格斯大学的学生也积极地参与我校承办的去年第六届的中国国际互联网加大学生创新创业大赛，也成为大赛不可或缺的一抹亮色。我们两校的教师云端的合作，携手执教罗格斯大学的 Rose 项目，这一创新合作也成为本次教学经验研讨会的良好基础。Vice President Eric Garfunkel has visited Scoot in December 2020, and we met. and He unveiled the overseas teaching base of Rutgers University. He also became the first foreign university representative to visit China since the new COVID-19 epidemic was in a normalized prevention and control stage. Rutgers University students actively participated in the Six China International Internet Plus College Student Innovation. And entrepreneurship competition hosted by our school, which has become an indispensable highlight of the competition. The teachers of the two schools cooperated online and join and jointly taught the Rose program of Rutgers University. This innovative cooperation has also become the foundation for this teaching experience seminar. 人才培养也是大学的生命线。我们两校也一贯重视本科的教学。致力于培养兼备复合知识与核心能力、具具有全球胜任力、能够引领未来和驾驭变化的人才，而且也取得了显著的成果。Talent training is the lifeline of the university. The two universities have always noted importance to undergraduate teaching and are committed to cultivating talents who possess compound knowledge, core competence, global ability, future leadership, and capability. We have achieved remarkable results. 本次 Rose 项目给了我们两校教学团队一个非常好的机会，使彼此深度来了解教育教学的理念、课程体系和教学的方法，并在教学的实践当中来检验我们教学的效果。我相信老师们也一定会有非常精彩的分享。我也衷心希望能够通过本次 Rose 合作。的研研讨会来共同探索提高人才培养质量的创新途径，探索后疫情时期我们高等教育合作的创新模式。This Rose program gave the faculty teams of the two schools a very good opportunity to deeply understand each other's education and teaching concept, curriculum systems, and teaching methods. It also allows us to test the teaching result in teaching practice. I believe that the teachers will have a wonderful collaboration together. I also sincerely hope that through the Rose Corporation and seminar, we can jointly explore innovative ways to improve the quality of talent training and explore innovative models of higher education cooperation in the post-pandemic period. 最后，预祝本次教学经验交流研讨会圆满成功。谢谢大家。Finally, I wish this. I wish the discussion exchange success. Thank you so much. Thank you. <coughs> 好的，感谢李卫琴副校长的支持。Thank you. 下面我们有。Thank you, Vice President. 罗格斯大学副校长，感。卡卡凡克博士致开幕词，大家欢迎。谢谢。And next, we're going to welcome Dr. Eric Garfunkel, Vice President of Rutgers University, to give an opening speech. Welcome. 早上好，我们的广州朋友。啊、uh, ，Thank you also, especially Vice President Li Weiqing and Director Shang Zhong. Um, I am、uh, Rick Garfunkel. I'm a Third-year professor of、uh, chemistry and physics、uh, here at Rutgers, and the five-year、uh, I've been in charge of the Rutgers、uh, global office. Am I being translated or just speak in English?、Uh, you can you can speak, and I will translate it in the box for you, in the chat box. In the chat box, okay.、Mm -hmm. um, uh, okay, so、uh, Rutgers is.、Um, 
the state, you know, for those that don't know Rutgers in at South China University of Technology, Rutgers is the State University of New Jersey. We're a comprehensive university with about 70,000 students. It's about 8,000 faculty full-time and part-time and about eight or 9,000 international students, half of whom are from China, uh, located in the US and so maybe one hour Southwest of New York City. Um, we have decades of collaboration with uh, between Rutgers and South China University and Technology. And I first learned about your university maybe three decades ago from uh, Lily and Wise Young from our School of Environmental and Biological Sciences and School of Arts and Sciences. I've probably visited uh, your university 10 times in the past three decades. Uh, uh, in fact, one time I, I remember when I was meeting there, I met a colleague who I hadn't seen at Rutgers in three years. He was in the in the lobby of a hotel in Guangzhou and he was doing research with you. Uh, most recently, as was just mentioned, I was there four months ago and it was a very nice a very, uh, a visit uh, to Scott, both to learn about the ROSE program and also uh, have uh, additional discussions about partnerships. Um, we have a long history, as I mentioned, of partnership. Uh, some of the earlier ones was in a School of Environmental and Biological Sciences. There's been extensive research on soil science, uh, uh, water, bioremediation, food science. And we even have some double degrees in, in food science and environmental science and biotechnology. Uh, we also have, um, with our business school, a uh, three plus one program with your, the Scott School of Business Administration. Between our, our School of Engineering, we have a three plus two program with your School of uh, Electronic and Information Engineering. And many of us from my school, which is original school, which is the School of Arts and Science, we also have a good history of collaboration. From those collaborations and from these kind of exchange programs, three plus one, three plus two, and We've uh, received several hundred students that came that were originally undergraduates at Scott, and they have come to us as either graduate students or as postdocs, and in a few cases as undergraduates in sandwich programs. And we would very much like to continue with these kind of programs, two plus two, three plus one, three plus two. And this year, of course, we thank you very, very much for hosting 100 of our uh, Rutgers students who have been stuck in China this year in the ROSE program. Uh, I would like to thank uh, Fang Du, who helped arrange uh, tonight's e uh, program with Scott colleagues and the rest of the ROSE team for supporting them from our side, and Ji Hu and his team in Guangzhou for supporting uh, our students there, and of course you, uh, Scott University, and, and the many people who have supported our students throughout this past year. On behalf of the Rutgers president, the, the four chancellors and four provosts of Rutgers, I would like to thank you for this history of collaboration. I, I look very much forward to continuing it. Today, we are not gonna speak about the pandemic. We're not gonna speak about Donald Trump. We're gonna speak about academic partnership, about pedagogy and best practices. And I look forward to the discussion. Thank you, Dr. Gambako for your um, speech. And I thank you, um, Dr. Lee for your welcome speech. The next part of our session will be the pedagogy discussion from uh, three faculty members from Scott and also from three faculty members from Ruggers. So uh, we will first hear the presentations from uh, Professor Fu, Professor Mao, and Ms. Xu uh, on Scott's side. And then we'll leave about 10 to 15 minutes for questions and discussion. And then it will be um, our Ruggers colleagues' presentation. So, um, and our Scott colleagues, if you are ready, we can start the presentation now. Uh,首先今天的会议呈现您进入教学法研讨会阶段。首先是由华南理工大学方面的老师们,有副教授毛教授,还有区位老师一起进行分享。在三位老师分享之后呢，我们会留十到十五分钟的时间进行讨论与问答。我们现在可以分享各位老师的PPT. I think we are ready to project the PPT prepared by our Scott colleagues. Uh, okay, good evening, Zara's uh, friends, and uh, good morning to our SUT colleagues and students. Uh, today, I'd like to talk about something about the use of math in 
college physics. Use of math in college physics. Um, 突然听不清了。Ah,、uh, Professor Fu, we lost your voice. Fu 老师，我们突然听不清了。刚才听得很清楚，但现在好像突然。He's muted. He's muted. Now、okay. I'm muted. Hello. Is that okay? Hello. Okay. Now it's good. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Uh, so I like to talk something about the use of math in physics.、Uh, I teach college physics, and I find many students do not、uh, use math properly, or they do not know the exact meanings of、uh, exact physical meanings of、uh, math equation. Uh, so I think the reason is that there are many differences between high school physics and、uh, college physics. Now, in high school physics,、uh, usually the physical concepts, equations, and the phenomena are simple and intuitive, and they can be expressed by algebraic equations.、Uh, for example, the Newton's next, the Newton's second law of a particle. Newton's second law、uh, of Newton's second law of a particle's motion in one dimension.、Uh, so,、uh, Newton's second law、uh, tells us that a particle with mass m and is exerted by force f, then there will be acceleration, and this acceleration is proportional to f to the force and inversely proportional to the mass. So. This is simple algebraic equation, and usually uh, we uh, we treat f as constant. So f constant a is constant. We do not need to to integral. Then we find acceleration, and then we can、uh, calculate velocity and the displacement. So、uh, this is scalar quantity, and so most quantities are scalar quantities in high school. But in next. Uh, but in college physics,、uh, many quantities are varied quantities, and many quantities are not constant; they are variables. So we need to use differential equations, and this makes the、uh, equation or、uh, the field concepts more complicated.、Okay. <clears throat> so still, let's look at the, the next. Let's look at the equation and Newton's second law、uh, in college physics. So f is a vector; it has magnitude and direction, and m is mass. So the, the acceleration expressed as second derivative of the position vector, which is vector time t.、Uh, so in order to、uh, use mass in college physics, I have the following、um, ideas. Next. Uh, the first one,、uh, students should know the physical meaning of、um, of math formulas. Now take this example for、uh, for example the work done、uh, by for in one dimensional motion.、Uh, we know in math we、uh, discuss the integral, the definite integral. So definite integral next. Definite integral is some function of x,、uh, x f x dx from、uh, x i to x f. To explain the integral, the definite integral in math,、uh, we say we use the graph. Use the graph next. Now we use graph. So in this graph, the horizontal axis is x is position and the vertical axis in math. It also It is also a position. It is y in the vertical direction. So the definite integral gives the area. So if we、uh, look at graph, it is area, a shaded area. But in physics, here the f, the vertical axis, is not a space coordinate. It's a force. It's a force. Therefore, even though we next,、uh, even though we say the area is the under the function of x. F is worked on during this motion, but here the unit of area not meter squared but a joule. So、uh, we should understand that for each for each physical quantity, it should have、uh, some unit, some unit. But in math, they are all numbers. Okay, next. <clears throat> 
Uh, so the second point is that, uh, that math is effective uh, to uh, describe physical laws. Uh, take angular quantity, uh, take, take the uh, angular ro rotational motion as example, uh, to describe, <coughs> uh, to describe the uh, rotational motion, we need to introduce angular quantities. Angular quantities, uh, in, includes uh, such as angular velocity, angular acceleration, uh, and uh, later we will study angular momentum. Uh, so when we uh, look at um, rotation, rotation, uh, okay, next. Uh, we see, for example, the this body is rotating about axis. Uh, we we see that the, the body is rotating clockwise or counterclockwise if we uh, observe its motion uh, from top or from bottom. But this is not convenient. So can we find uh, a quantity, a mathematical quantity to describe the rotation, this angle velocity? Uh, yes, we use the angle velocity. Uh, we take the angle velocity as a vector. So in this case, in this case, we use a hand rule, the right hand rule, we, we curl our four fingers and extend the thumb points to the direction of the rotation. So by a single vector, we can describe the angular velocity, angular velocity. So some students may uh, ask a question, why do we use this uh, quantity, this angular velocity? Uh, but I like to ask them that, uh, do you have any other better way to describe motion? No, if no, this is best way to describe the angular velocity. Okay. Next. Yeah. Next. Okay, uh, the third point is uh, sometimes math proof or physical laws is necessary. Uh, take the parallel axis theorem as example. Now this theorem says uh, we have two, for this body, we have two uh, axes. One, no, one is through the center of mass. So C is center of mass of the body. And the other uh, is uh, parallel to uh, this axis, but uh, with the distance h. So if we know the rotational inertia of IC, the rotational inertia of this axis through the center mass, and we know the distance between two axes, then we can simply get the rotational inertia of the body about this axis. So it, uh, it is I equals IC plus mh. A square. Uh, but students may uh, do not understand why the first axis must be uh, the axis through the center mass. So it is not, uh, not intuitive to uh, say uh, this law, but if we do some mathematical derivation, we will find that this is true. Uh, we must, uh, in using the a parallel axis the theorem, we must choose the first axis as the one which is through the center of mass. So the proof is the following. Next. 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 And so in this proof, the key point is some mi x i prime equals zero. Uh, in fact, this is definition if uh, this quantity divided by the total mass of the body is a definition for the center mass. And here we choose C is center mass. So this must be zero. Otherwise, if the uh, first exit does not uh, get through the center mass, this will not be zero. Uh, <clears throat> now, I, I also like to talk about two of, uh, some advantages of math. Uh, sometimes a physical law is not intuitive and it is uh, it's not easy to understand. But my suggestion as, uh, is that you uh, do not struggle with physics. You do not spend too much time. Uh, you do math first, do math first. The example here uh, I show is angular momentum. So this is a definition of angular momentum. One particle is moving, uh, we choose a reference point O, and uh, this is a particle's uh, momentum, and uh, the position vector is R, then the angular momentum is defined R cross P. But students, 
do not know, maybe at the first, do not understand the reason why the uh, angular momentum is defined in this way. Uh, but they are familiar with the Newton second law for particle, Newton second law for particle. So Newton second law for, for particle uh, is df dt uh, equals f, uh, dp dt equals f, p is momentum. So the change of momentum equals force exerted on a particle. Now, if we do uh, some uh, derivation, dl dt. Now, how about dl dt? So dl dt, then d dt r cross b r cross p, and we will find dl dt equals tau. So finally, we get uh, this uh, law dl dt next. Uh, dl dt equals tau. So this equation is similar to uh, the uh, equation the uh, theorem for momentum of our particle, so translation for translation of particle. This is for uh, the rotation of particle. So, uh, so this is important for students to uh, first study uh, the, some uh, theoretical courses such as uh, the electrodynamics and quantum mechanics. You don't know the meaning, maybe at the first you don't know the physical meaning, but you do the math at first. After that, you uh, do more practice and solve more problems, you will understand the meaning of the uh, formula equations. So to summarize, I like to give uh, some suggestions to students. Uh, one, uh, math preparation is necessary for physics, uh, uh, especially the calculus and uh, vectors. Uh, two, math concepts and equations have physical meanings. So every time you uh, say a physical uh, uh, say a equation, physical equation, you should be clear about the meaning of each quantity in the formula in equation. And number three, rigorous math definition proofs are helpful to understand physics. So in college physics, many physical concepts and the laws are not so intuitive. You must do a rigorous uh, math math uh, proof math proof. Okay. Uh, finally, do not even math and do not be afraid of math. In fact, even though when we study math course, uh, there are many, 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 many laws and theorems, but in fact, in studying physics, uh, we only use a few. So do uh, not be afraid. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Professor Su, for your uh, wonderful speech. This is a wonderful example of the importance of interdisciplinary knowledge even in first year college teaching. 谢谢傅老师的精彩演讲。从另外一个侧面证明了跨学科教学、跨学科知识在大一新生大课中的重要性. The next presenter will be Professor Mao from Scott. 下一位演讲的人是华工理科大学的毛教授。Okay, dear Vice President Eric, dear Director from ROCKS, SAUT, and the ROSE, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. I'm Dr. Mao from SAUT, and currently I'm the uh, professor's, uh, 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 associate professor in the computer science. Okay, I'm very happy here today with you together to talk, to uh, have discussion about these topics. Actually, how about the two have a good teach about, uh, for the first year basic courses. I think it, this is a very general topic, right? So I don't want to uh, describe more on my course. I want to share some common sense about the teaching and the study. Okay, so firstly, I would like to have a very short introduction about myself. Uh, after I get my PhD from Hong Kong Polytechnic University in nine, 2009, and then I joined SAUT and uh, engaged in full English teaching and uh, for more than 10 years. I already do many surface work uh, in the sales department for the full English teaching. And uh, from last year, I also attended the international office of SAUT. And uh, at Dell, I'm very close with the administrative team for the Rose project. So I think, and I also expected to work more hard to make sure this Rose project more successful, right? That is my original intention. But later I found this is a real, uh, really a very real chance for us 
to experience the difference of the teaching mode from the Chinese and from the America. And then very interesting, we teach the Chinese then here, but we use the American teaching mode, right? So it's really an unbelievable experience, right? Okay. Uh, until now, I already teach four, four English course for the SAUT undergraduate and for the first year, for the second year, and for the third year. And one of my course last year was awarded as the national first rate course of the Ministry of Education of China in 2019. Okay, so from last year, uh, I joined the Rose team and uh, give the lecture for two courses. Uh, that is the computer science, uh, the Java programming, another course is for the data structure. Okay, so, okay, sorry, maybe the different version of the PPT, so it's the wrong format. <laughs> okay, so actually today we are here talking about the common topic about how to teach the first year uh, basic courses. I think it should include the two main keywords here. The first would like be how to teach. I think that is a very common sense for all the different fields, right? how to teach, how to be a good teacher, how to lead a good study. And then I would like to turn the focus to the first year student. Then, okay, so then is the, I think the topic should uh, cover these two different issues. Then I would like to have some, discuss some things to understand what is the learning process and understand the student so that we can lead a good teaching and the study for the student, okay? Then it's to design the teaching mode, I think. Okay, so firstly, let's have a, a look on what is the learning process. Actually, according to the Bloom taxonomy, we found that learning actually is much deeper than the memorization and the information recall. We may find that, remember, it's only on the bottom of the study or learning, right? So deep learning, actually you may find, it involves remembering, understanding, applying knowledge, critical thinking, and ability to produce the new and original work. Thus, regardless of the field of the study, students need to develop and practice thinking process, like they need to know how to solve the problem. That is the, then is the purpose of learning, right? Okay, so we should give students opportunities to lead learning activities, to participate more actively in discussion, design the own leading project and explore topics that interest them. And at the same time, we also can get some interesting information from the learning pyramid from this parameter, we may found that the student actually only get 5% by lecture. It's really amazing, right? Maybe very uh, strange and a surprise to us. 10% by reading and 20% by the audiovisual, 30% by demonstration and 50% by discussion. <laughs> Thus, from this parameter, we can say lecture is one of most ineffective methods for learning. So it only, and also it only works when the student arrive class be prepared. So we are better to encourage student to have a preview and have practice before the class. That is very important for the student have a good class. And for the teacher, we should incorporate various audio and visual tool to develop attractive learning material. That is one of important things to attract the student attention and greatly improve learning by making a group study because just we know 50% is obtained from the discussion. And demonstrate learning tasks to offer students less ambiguity than passive study method. That is also a very important key. 
Okay, lastly, we also would like to find some interesting thing from the student attention curve. From this curve, we may found that on class, actually students are not attending to teachers lecturing about 40% of the time. That's really terrible. And the student attention spans in passive task is only about 50 minutes, 15 minutes. This really makes breaking up a in-class lecture with activity and the discussion very, very important, right? Okay, so we are better encouraging them to have uh, in love discussion, in love practice, in love speak out. Okay, and then the second part we would like to understand the student. Just now we said this is a course for the first student, first year student, right? And for the Rose student, actually they have very special background that we know last year. It's really a difficult year last year, right? So student actually, uh, they want to go about for study, but also the fears of the COVID-19 infection and uncertain, right? They're unsure about the future plans. So from this point of view, we can say they are very anxious, right? But we also can read some things from the news, like from the CGTN news. The report said, while 37% of the respondents said, they are not at all likely or unlikely to cancel the plan. That means this is kind of student, the steer very persistent for the future study. Okay, so with this understanding about the background of the Rose student, then we can turn the focus to the roles of the student that is the uh, first year student, right? The uh, first year. So what is the first year student characteristics? Actually, they need to change the role from the high school student. Remember, they just graduated from the high school, right? So the master change the role from the high school to the university freshman. The master know how to lead or carry out a study in the university. But generally, the freshmen in the university, the will have the cognitive challenge about the learning. Usually they would like regard the study like just as the examination. So they frequently will ask the teacher, will this will be on the test? <laughs> yeah, <coughs> so we all are confused, right? They assume the job is just to memorize the course material for the examination. Thus, for the teachers, we need, uh, we need to help the first year student to move beyond the memorization to the deep learning. So here we mentioned many times for deep learning. And that we should lead the teach student to have the critical thinking, that is teach them how to critical thinking make it clear the lures, give them opportunities to practice critical thinking and clarify the strategies for learning. That is, tell them, help students understand practice approaches to learning in and out of the classroom, like you have enough discussion, reading and do the project. <laughs> 这个画的它那个瀑布传热的影响因素最大的曲线，但是感觉效果还不是特别理想。嗯，就是它那两个情况还是没有在那一起。Okay, uh, oh, maybe some noise from the audience. Okay, let's continue. And also prepare for the emotional reaction. That is explain why and what ask a student to do. That is very important because the student maybe don't know why you let to do this, why you ask them to have exercise, right? So tell them and offer supportive and encourage. Okay, from these se several views to understand, then we can come to design the teaching mode. Uh, usually now we are very encouraging the student centered teaching mode. So about this mode, we don't need to explain too much about the details here because it's already reported in many papers and the reference, right? But we know the key uh, keyword or key idea in the student-centered teaching mode, that is key change the roles of student and the instructors. That is, let a student be more active, participate on the class. 
and change the teachers to be just a coach for them. Okay, so due to time reason, uh, here I just sharing some of my experience on the class. Like in my first class, I will try to explain the method the learn about the learning and the teaching. Tell the student what is the good learning. So I will explain the concept like the individual study and the group study and the learning and the application and the, what is surface learning, what is deep learning, and also tell them the different levels, different levels in the learning. And uh, importantly, I will, at the first class, I will make them into groups and organize them into group study for the whole semester. That is for the discussion, for the presentation, and for the course project. And at that time, I also will tell them the diversified assessment method for the course. Yeah. And uh, on the class, I try best to engage students in the learning. That is like organize the storytelling class. Uh, everyone like a story, right? So arrange the class into the sections and the seniors according to the problems. So the section may be included to raise the problems, to introduce the key knowledge, and then have some demonstration. Lastly, ask a student to have application or transfer the knowledge. Okay, don't forget to encourage student uh, have enough preview before the class, have discuss and speak on the class, and have a practice after class. Okay, for teacher, it also, we need to make use of the video, image, text, and the spoken word to improve the attention for the, to the student. Just now we already get the information from the, uh, the attention curve, right? Okay, and uh, last, don't forget to develop an emotional reaction with the student. Try to make friends with them. So warm up the class, with the student issue and the concerns, I think it's a helpful way uh, to develop a connection with the student. And the share the real world experience, that is also very important. Let a student more uh, easily understand what you are thinking, what you are talking, right? Full use of the examples from the daily living to help them. And also don't forget to provide the online opportunities. That is the student, even they cannot speak on the class, they still have opportunity to ask questions after the class. Okay, and lastly, I think the point is flag reflection. That is a very important way for us to think about whether the teaching mode is effective, whether it can work. Uh, so we can give the feedback, not only to the student in time, we also need to give the feedback to my myself. Okay, uh, lastly, here is some teaching date of the CS111. I teach the lowest course last semester. And uh, yes, just we said, it's very interesting. For this course, all the material syllabus and the assessment is standard for all the different area, uh, like from the Guangzhou, from the Shanghai, and even around the whole world. And uh, the assessment actually is evaluated by the American colleagues. Okay, and uh, from the Great distribution uh, in this table, we found that actually the grade in Guangzhou uh, is some degree better than the student in Shanghai and the no low student. So I also very happy to see that. Okay, so that is some sharing uh, from my views. Thank you for your listening. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Ma, for the wonderful presentation. This is a, you know, classic case of a learner-centered pedagogy, which is especially valuable in STEM fields. 谢谢毛教授的精彩的演示, the next presenter will be Miss Chu Wei, and uh, <coughs> she is um, also teaching regular students for this semester. And then uh, let's have Ms. Chiwi uh, do her presentation. And now we have 10 minutes for questions and uh, discussion time. 
下一位啊，为我们做演示的是华南理工大学的屈威老师，他也是这学期为我们 Rose 学生任课的老师之一。在屈威老师发言之后呢，我们会有十分钟左右的时间进行问题与讨论、问答与讨论。Okay, shall I begin now? Um, friends, colleagues from both Scott and uh, Ruckus, uh, good morning. My name is Chu Wei, and I'm gonna present a.、Uh, okay, thank you very much. Ah,、uh, so it is a very,、uh, it is a great honor for me to be here to share with all of you some teaching experience of me. Um, so the title of my presentation is called "Improving Student Learning via Flipped Teaching Mode." So I'm gonna start with、um, what a flipped model is.、Um, well, this idea is not that new, and、uh, it was first、uh, provide promoted by、um, Jonathan Bergman, Aaron Sams, both chemistry teachers from Colorado. And they have、um, published a book called the Flip Your Classroom. And、um, well, there are four characteristics of、uh, Flip, namely flexible environment,、uh, learning culture, intentional content, and a professional educator. So I'm gonna talk about these four aspects、uh, from my、uh, by using.、Uh, By using my own course as a case study, from these aspects, namely organization structure, student engagement, and、uh, reflection. So, starting from this course,、uh, the course title is Film Studies, and the、um, the objectives of, of this course is、um, to provide the students with a general introduction of、uh, the basic aesthetic and.、Uh, Uh, artistic view、uh, introduction of films. At the same time, to try to understand the film from a historical, cultural, and critical critical view. So it is、um, an, an optional general education course, and、uh, most of the students who had chosen this course are students who have already learned English,、uh, either English for special purposes. Or、uh, for academic purposes, or college English, so、uh, they have already had a uh, basic uh, skills, some basic skills of English learning, and、um, well, nowadays the flipped classroom is very widely used in a lot of、um, general educational cor education courses in Scott. So mine is one of the cases.、Um, all. The course hour for our for my course is thirty、um, two hours, so、um, using fourteen hours online、uh, for students to study online while、uh, meeting the students、um, six weeks for、uh, three hours per week,、uh, altogether eighteen hours、uh, offline, which is in class. So、uh, we have built already built a、um, on an online course on Xue Tang X,、uh, called Film and Cultural Studies in 2001, and、uh, there are three parts in this online course,、um, starting from the formalistic approach and、uh, film critique, and in the third part,、uh, which is Unit 11 and 12,、uh, there is a case study of one film. And it's a synthetic, a synthesis of a film criticism, a film critique. So、um, the organization and、uh, still organization structure and the grading system is、uh, divided into two parts,、um, half and half. So 50% for online study and、uh, 50% for in-class study. So、uh, you can see it from this chart. So I have divided my、uh, flipped classroom into three、uh, parts, which is pre-class, in-class, and after-class. And、uh, respectively, I have designed it、um, activities for students to better understand the、uh, concepts, theoretical ideas. At the same time, we、uh, need to put all of these things in practice. So in pre-class activities,、uh, students are required to. Watch the micro lectures and、uh, the film assigned to them, and of course some of the reading materials as well. And at the very beginning of the class, students are、uh, 
are divide, are required to do an assessment too. I'm going to send them a survey so that they can answer the questions and get to know themselves better. So um, while they have fully prepared, they are uh, we are going to meet in class. So students are divided into groups and uh, we will have a lot of group activities. Um, first of all is to clarify the concepts and to make sure they have fully understand all these ideas and then uh, they will learn to how uh, they will learn how to solve the problems by using all these concepts as well as uh, the theoretical ideas, the critical theories. So of course we will still have one class period to uh, appreciate the films that's uh, assigned at in advance. So after class, students would uh, you know uh, reinforce what they have learned in class. And of course, I will give you give them another assessment at the end of the uh, the end of the semester so that they can know what they have learned in class. The, uh, uh, the class activities can uh, vary due to different classes. So uh, pre-class activities it would include, but not uh, necessarily just this, pre-screening, uh, mind mapping, uh, mind map, movie poster preparation of uh, their presentation, online quizzes, etc. While in-class activities include group discussion on concepts, uh, theories, and student presentation on the assigned movie and uh, the uh, concepts and theories as well. And then we, will, we can have free discussion led by students and in-class quizzes. The purpose of all these in-class activities is to uh, give the classroom to the students so that they can lead. At the same time, uh, this classroom is designed to be student-centered. So uh, the professors only to be an observer. And at the same time, if they do have something that they really don't understand, um, the professor can step in and uh, at the same time, make some, uh, give some very brief lectures about um, what, they, what they have not paid attention to and uh, what they have missed. And for act after class activities, mostly these are designed to reinforce uh, the student's understanding of, um, of the uh, ideas, of the concepts. So I would design the short online discussion tasks, um, a brief movie review or some summary posts on the uh, discussion forum. And also I would invite students to recommend some films that they think are uh, very good because <laughs> a lot of students would uh, regard the films assigned or put on the list are quite uh, are not as they expected. So they would recommend some of them, uh, some of their favorite films to their peers. So um, here are some pictures of our student engagement in class. So most of the classes are, are uh, we, we have most classes in the smart room, smart classroom and uh, while the students are preparing for the classes, they would decide where they can sit. And um, normally I would ask them to sit in groups. And in these classrooms, we can, use, uh, we can make full use of this multimedia. Uh, here's another, uh, another picture of my students uh, playing move charades. I have designed a lot of uh, uh, interesting, I have uh, designed a lot of interesting games for them to, uh, you know, to warm up and as an icebreaker, as an icebreaker uh, so that they can uh, get interested in the class. And here are some of the data. Uh, what I use is a, uh, an app called Rain Classroom uh, produced by Tsinghua University and uh, uh, my course, the online course, Film and Cultural Studies, is also on the uh, platform, uh, Xue Tang X, uh, which is also a production of Tsinghua University. So through this app, I can, uh, I can ask the students to scan the QR code each time before they come to class so that I would know how many students have in, already entered the classroom. Here is the number, like 46. And uh, during the class, um, I have designed uh, like quizzes, uh, short questions, and uh, some other tasks in class so that I could immediately know 
uh, whether the students have understood uh, the uh, lectures or the discussion or the concepts, etc. So I would find um, the name list of the excellent students as well as the students who are uh, the warning students, quotation mark. Okay. And um, um, there are also some, um, some questions. So the, the teacher, the professor could grade online and I also can get access to all this data on uh, online, um, you know, the in-class in data of all the students. Okay. And, and on, the, on the discussion forum, um, there are also uh, activities. So uh, students could provide short answers to the uh, questions um, posted by the professors directly. This is me. So I would propose questions before and invite students to answer. And uh, uh, this is online discussion forum. And also the students would, uh, are required to make uh, mind maps on each unit uh, so that it can have a very clear structure of uh, what they have learned in that unit. For example, when uh, in unit seven, we have learned uh, film, race, ethnicity, and film. So they have made a very clear mind map in regard with this issue. And then um, students would also make some posters. Uh, here's just one sample on the uh, films assigned. This is the uh, the assigned film for the first unit form and uh, on form, film form. So I've selected rear window um, and uh, ask, ask students to talk about the function of windows as well as um, talk about the uh, formalistic features of this film. So some students would design a uh, poster while you know, putting all these words on this poster. Well, this one is, uh, there are even uh, better ones. So this is just an example. And uh, here, are some, here are some data of the student satisfaction survey, uh, the fall semester of 2020. Um, altogether, there were 79 students and I have selected several questions from these students. Uh, like I have in uh, whether they have improved their interactive skills, uh, whether they have achieved their goal set at the beginning of the class, and uh, whether the course is interesting, inspiring, and informative, etc. Uh, of course, at the end of the, at the end of this class, I would, uh, together with my team member, uh, analyze all this data and try to find figure out a better way to improve. Like, um, uh, for example, sometimes students would say, I soon forget what I have learned in the micro lectures. Because um, uh, from the data, we can see that, um, well, about 30% students would have this kind of feeling of forgetting what have been learned. So that's what we are going to solve in class because we are, go we are going to help them uh, bring back what has been forgotten. And of course, I would tell them that, um, well, education survives when what has been learned has been forgotten. So uh, that was a joke, but um, well, this is one of the uh, quote I would ask a student to remember because you, they don't have to be anxious or panic if they have forgotten what they have learned in uh, online, but um, as, they, as soon as they have devoted themselves in this learning, process, I'm sure we can, you know, find some way for them to uh, digest what has been uh, learned here. And uh, then we will find some way to reinforce and uh, make this knowledge themselves theirs. Okay, sorry. Um, and then here is the reflection in relate to the four uh, aspects that we have mentioned at the very beginning of the class, which is flexible environment, learning culture, intentional content, and professional educator. So uh, in my perception, I think um, uh, using a flipped teaching mode has actually allows the students to get uh, more self-placed and uh, more involved in the study uh, process of study. And of course, uh, sometimes stu students would be very um, easy 
easily uh, to be distracted because there are so many things online. So we would find some, uh, we would just design some tasks so that the students can uh, finish, uh, try to uh, finish all these tasks while uh, watching the online videos. Uh, for learning culture, I, I would, uh, I prefer a flipped teaching mode because actually this has some, um, you know, switch the traditional instructional mode to a uh, student learner centered model. And in class, their students have more time to get engaged and get involved in uh, talking about the subject, the concepts they have already learned. At the same time, they have more opportunities to speak up instead of, you know, you know sitting there listening to the instructor all the time. So uh, what is more important is the uh, role of the professor because uh, we have to design the tasks and we have very where uh, we have uh, to choose the uh, materials very carefully. Uh, that's the part of the intentional content. So we have to design, we have to decide which uh, materials, reading materials, or the videos they're going to watch. At the same time, I uh, take my course as an example, I would try to uh, update the uh, watching list for the students each semester so that we can have a better learning and the teaching ex experience. To, in a word, um, it's a more challenging and demanding uh, role for the uh, instructor. Uh, more than ever, but I kind of like it. So at the end of my presentation, I, <coughs> excuse me. Um, so I'm going to uh, quote from uh, one, of, uh, one of the scientists, which is the father of AI, um, Mar Marvin Minsky. He said, you don't understand anything until you learn it more than one way. So I have been teaching for 10 years and I still don't understand teaching because I still need to learn every semester with every uh, with different students and um, our different courses. Uh, so that's it for my presentation. Thanks for your listening. And Thank you, Ms. Chiwei. Thank you, Chiwei uh, There is a lot of, um, I think this is an extremely well-managed course with a lot of data in, behind the management system. So I'm sure all those information will be very informative for future teaching. Now I'm opening the floor for some questions and discussion. Now I'm opening the floor for some questions if you have questions, feel free to put it in the chat box, or you can just, um, you know, just open your mic and uh, unmute yourself and raise the question uh, to the whole room, to the whole Zoom room. I see one. Are uh, there learning differences from students in the same course taught in English versus taught in Chinese? Uh, 啊，用中文教和用英文教有什么样的学习差异吗？ Uh, 嗯。先。啊，周瑞在讨论的时候，麻烦你做一下。我们讨论的时候，那个翻译会用对话对话框里面，会在对话框里进行翻译。傅老师、毛老师、戚老师 
内容完全一样。呃，但是最后总的效果应该差不多。其实就像刚才那位老师说的，课堂上可能老师只是一个引导作用啊，课堂引导作用。他呃，课后呢，因为我们用的比如说都是英文教材，我就是这样说，课堂上用英语讲，跟课堂上用中文讲同样的内容，呃，这个差别不是太大。呃，关键是，呃，课后的学习，我觉得是这样的，就是只要学生他的英语不是太差，呃，应该效果差不多。<笑>好的，谢谢傅老师。啊、uh, ，the translation is in the chat box. Rick, you have a question? Yeah, the Pedagogy methods that、uh, Professor Mao and Chu talked about. How uniform are they across China? Is this just a scut and five percent, or is this very common in China? Uh, um, Dr. Gasanko's question is, is just like we were talking about in the conversation about these teaching methods. In China, it is widespread. It is can be used in practical areas. It is widespread. It is can be used in practical areas. It is widespread. 在多大的范围内能够得到实施？然后在中国的范围内，如果你们有一些信息，能够得到多大范围的实施呢？嗯。Okay, thank you very much for uh, uh, President Eric, your good question. I think it's really a good question for all the teachers. And uh, uh, in my introduction just now, I said one of my courses、uh, awarded as the first rate of the Minister of Education in China last year. So at at that Why the、uh, Minister of Education have such a plan? That is now the Minister of Education in China. The encourage all the teachers in the all the university try to have a teaching innovation. That is try to regard the student as the center to teach them. So it just now widely、uh, to introduce for all the teachers, and the, all the teachers that now are facing these problems. They need to do something to make the change, make the innovation to change the teaching mode to get to know more about the teaching itself. I think so. Yes, yes. The things is just changing, and I hope every student, every teachers, are、uh, just uh, adjust, uh, change or adjust the changing the teaching mode and、uh, get to know more about the teaching itself. Yes, and in SAOT. Actually, we can find many my colleagues, many teachers that are involved this,、uh, the applying this uh, uh, project from the、uh, administrator of uh, uh, education of China.、Uh, that is a national national level project. So the teachers could apply this project and、uh, take this chance to make、uh, the innovation in the teaching.、Uh, okay, so yes, that is. The this current state of the China. Thank you. Thank you, Mao 老师的回答。啊，大家正在变革中，而且都是越变越好，是吧 ？We are in the process of changing, and surely, ah, for sure, to change for the better. Ah, in terms of pedagogy research. So, any other questions from the audience? Feel free to raise your hand or just unmute yourself to ask. Um. While there are no particular questions asked, I will take this opportunity to,、uh, to just、um, you know bring the spotlight to our translator, Miss Fu Zhuori. Ah, if everyone is not aware of this, I would like to stress that Miss Fu Zhuori is always providing translation services to teachers. Thank you, Miss Zhuori. 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 Start the presentation on Ragged Side.、Uh, the first presenter will.、Uh, there will be three presenters on Ragged Side, and after the three presentations, we open up the floor again for more questions and discussions. The first presenter is Dr.、Uh, Eric Carlin, who is from the Mathematics Department of Rutgers University. Hi, Dr. Carlin. Welcome. <laughs> uh, 第一位是我们罗格斯数学系的，嗯、um, ，Eric Carlin 教授。他是数学系的本科教育的主任，同时也是罗格斯杰出教授教学的奖项获得者。
Okay, well, well, thank you very much, Feng Du. It's a pleasure to meet the colleagues at uh, Scott who are teaching the Rutgers courses. And I've been very glad to see in the previous presentations, a lot of the active learning techniques that we've been teaching, flip classrooms and so forth. And in the last presentation, the quote of Marvin Minsky was absolutely a perfect finish. I mean, learning is an iterative process. And going back and forth and learning things several ways and returning to things in the curriculum, I think is really the core of what we have found to be effective for teaching students. In the presentation that I would like to make, um, I, okay, I, I would like to focus on some more high, some, some other issues of what exactly are we trying to teach cal in these calculus courses? And let me see, uh, think, are, will you, do you have the videos there or should I? Uh, do you have the screen? Yes, great. Okay, perfect. And good, okay. Oops, okay, right. So here are a bit, uh, at Rutgers we have two Calculus 1 and 2 courses for students who enter. There's a Math 135 and it's called Calculus 1 and 2 for the Life and Social Sciences. And there's a Calculus 151, 152 for the Mathematical and Physical Sciences. Now the Math 135 is a terminal course mostly. Most students who take 135 do not take any higher level calculus course, not even the 136, a small percentage of them do that. On the other hand, almost all students who successfully complete 151 and 152 go on to take calculus three and four. So why are these two tracks? What are the students hoping to get out of these courses? What are, what are the, actually the students have signed up for these courses because their major departments have required them. They wouldn't want to be there otherwise in many cases. And, but so the real question is what, what have the hope parent home departments, why have they required these courses? What are we trying to accomplish? Okay, um, let me see next. Oh, I can't, oh, here we go, great. So, so who takes these courses? So the Math 135 is required by the Rutgers Business School. And within the School of Arts and Sciences, economics majors form a particularly large group with various other majors focused on biological sciences and so forth. The pharmacy school, for example, a lot of these other people. Now, now many of these people, this later, will, will never compute a derivative again in their careers. Right. So what what is it they're hoping to get out to this? OK, that's the question we'll come back to later. Now, on the other hand, the other track, the majority of the students in math 151 and 152 are future engineers. OK, so there are many students from more mathematical tracks through economics and computer science as well. And there are a few math majors, but that's a small number within the large Rutgers group. So the bottom line, most of these students are there because the course is required by another department, their home department. Okay, so yeah, next please. Right. So when we teach these courses, what, what are we trying to accomplish and what determines the syllabus? So because these courses are populated from students by students from other departments that have required the courses, we, we meet with these departments, faculty in them on a regular basis and discuss how the courses are doing them. Are they preparing the students to do what they need to do? Are they, are they serving the purpose for which they have required these courses? And these two things are very different. You know, in the engineering school, the students will be doing these kinds of calculations. They have to learn the material in the syllabus and they will use it day in and day out when they're taking these courses and again in the rest of their careers. The students in say the business school, the pharmacy school, a pharmacist does not need to compute derivatives or do integrals or whatever to fulfill the daily operations of their profession. So why are they taking it? Well, I mean, the, these schools want, need people to, they want their graduates to have a certain level of proficiency with precise, rigorous quantitative reasoning. And this is what the course is for. So, and, and this gets back to some of the, the points that were raised in the pedagogy in the previous three talks. We are not trying to teach memorization. There's absolutely zero value in teaching students to memorize some steps and say, okay, when you do this kind of problem, you do that. You know, teaching some sort of dance step approach to calculus is absolutely worthless to our client departments. Okay, uh, ready for the next? Okay, so, so while, while the, this, and I guess they've said part of this already, I mean, the engineering school, you know, is actually teaching people. They want people to learn the skills. The skills that are on the syllabus, they need to know them. 
They also, though, really need people to think because anything that can be done in a sort of a rote memorization way has been programmed into a computer and a computer can do it better than it, faster than any student can do it and much more accurately. So there's absolutely no point in training people how to mindlessly execute computational algorithms. That is not the goal of our courses, either for the engineers or for SAS. So the bottom line for this is that none of our clients' apartments would be satisfied by a course that simply trains students to solve certain types of calculus problems by rote memory. So for the courses to succeed, they must raise the student's ability to reason mathematically. And, and I've been very reassured as seeing the previous presentations that you know, with the active learning, the component, we, you know, with, the, with the workshops we have at Rutgers, students are explaining things to one another. They are we're working on understanding the concept, saying why this is right. I mean, the most important example for, for, for many departments, what, what do you want to get out of mathematics? I mean, a, a poor student in a very rote course will be taught to execute certain steps. They arrive at the end of the calculation. They come up with an answer for a volume. It's a negative number. And they're happy with that. They write it down on the test. I mean, this is an absolute failure of pedagogy. I mean, what most of these departments are looking for is can someone do a calculation and at the end of the calculation decide whether the answer makes sense or not? Can, is it right? I mean, so the fundamental question that permeates all these courses is how do I know that when it's time to answer the question, how do I know my answer is right? Okay, I mean, this is what, you know, this, this in the end of the day is why the pharmacy school is requiring pharmacists to, to, to take the mathematics courses. I mean, this is rigorous training for this and, and this is the key question. I've come up with an answer, how do I know it's right? Okay, this is really our fundamental goal and all of the pedagogy has to be driven towards achieving this goal. Okay, thanks. Uh, next, please. Okay, so th these are massive courses here. In, in the fall of each year in the Math 135, that's the, the bigger the course, we have uh, 30, 30 lectures. Each lecture has 90 students in it. They're divided into three recitation groups. Okay, the Math 151, the one for the mathematical sciences and engineering, has about 75 students, and that's also broken into three workshop workshop groups, another misprint I see there, out of 25. And th these are smaller because the 151, these have workshops, they're interactive, they embody some of the active learning techniques that were mentioned in the previous presentations. The 135 is more a traditional recitation, students ask questions, the recitation structure answers them, and there are quizzes at the end of, of everything, okay? The courses are very tightly coordinated. They are run on a common syllabus, and well-documented. And, and this is important for the different courses for different reasons. For, for 135, the students are not going to go on to take calculus. This is their end calculus course, okay? So whether this course gets them ready for another calculus course or not is not so important. It is, they need certain things maybe for the biology course, but it's, it's, it's less, less intensive. Really here, we just need to be more sure that we've done a good job uniformly across the course in raising people's levels to reason mathematically precisely and decide when they finish the calculation, how do I know my answer is right without looking in the back of the book? Okay, that's, that's what it's about. For 151, of course, they're gonna take on, you know, someone comes out of a 151 section, they go into a 152, they go into a two, you know, the, the calculus three and four. And so the person teaching these needs to be a, needs to know that, okay, this is what they learned in the previous course and to count on it. So they have to be quite very tightly modulated. So, so of all these sections, you know, if one is a lecturer in one of these courses, one doesn't get to make up one's own syllabus. It's not the question of, okay, here's what I think calculus one is about. No, because there are these two tracks. You have this group of students, they need to know this. This is the plan we'll be on. Okay, I think next, please. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'll find it. And yeah, about assessment, how are the students assessed? So finally, at the end of the day, we have the main part of the assessment is tests and final exams. I've mentioned that there are quizzes in the recitations. This is mostly to keep the students engaged. If you don't put a quiz in the recitation, they may not show up. You know, if, if something is graded one or two points, they will put the effort in to catch those two points, okay? but the things are set up so that most of the people who are actively participating will get all the points they can get from homework, quizzes, and so forth. 
Okay, the real determination is the tests. In, indeed, the grading in, on the points they earn on homeworks and quizzes, this is stuff early on the learning curve. So we're not so concerned when we give final grades for a course as to how quickly the students pick things up. We want to know what did they master by the end of the course, okay? So the final exam tells us that, the tests tell us that, you know, the quizzes and the homework is about early in the learning curve. So the assessment is skewed to put a lot of emphasis on the tests in the final exam. So for many years, students in all sections of these courses have taken the same common final exam. And more recently, since we've gone in the pandemic, especially we have given common exams at Rutgers and Monday evening. So everyone takes the same exam. They're randomized to, you know, people get different versions of the question to, to cut down on the incentive for, for cheating or academic integrity. Um, and the other thing that we've done that has changed, and I think this has really improved our pedagogy, is that the kinds of questions we are asking now that we have remote testing are the kind of conceptual questions that our course was really aimed at at the beginning. Now, before the pandemic, um, we took the easy way out. We padded the exams. We had a lot of questions that only required rote memorization, rote computational skills to answer. Those can now be typed into Wolfram Alpha during an online exam. We can't really check it. And we have no interest in whether students can do that kind of stuff or not, because anyway, they can type it into Wolfram Alpha. We are more interested in how they can answer questions that really gauge their conceptual understanding of the subject. I mean, and then this fundamental question, how do I know my answer is right? And so our assessment focuses much more these days on, on these questions. We give many more smaller, shorter exams. And well, this is one of the golden linings that is few golden linings, maybe that has come out of this pandemic, is that I think our assessment of students' strategies, the focus is now in the right place. Okay, uh, next slide is, uh, this is the end here. It does. Thank you very much for your attention. So this is a little different from the previous talks. I mean, since I've taken on this role of undergraduate coordinator, I have not been actually lecturing in the classroom for the last two years. So I've missed this whole online teaching experience, but I'm heavily engaged in meeting all the time with people who are doing it. And um, well, so the focus there is, is the things that I'm focused on is making sure that the courses we offer, the syllabi are geared towards what, what has prompted the departments at Rutgers who have required these courses. Are we delivering the things that have made those departments require the courses? And then when it comes down to doing this, the, the last thing I would like to emphasize is what we've really found more than, we've done experiments, flipped classrooms, all, all kinds of things, but, you know, we, what we found is that some of our instructors, before we, we coordinated things more heavily, tried to organize things in such a way that they went through the syllabus in a very, you know, one thing after the other and did one topic in sequence, sequentially and got through the whole thing in a straight line. Their students did not so well. Iteration is the main thing. I, the, the quote from Marvin Minsky is great. I mean, we want to come back and learn things in many ways, do things over and over again, always refer back to the early course. And, and this, this is what makes things work, I think, especially well. But, but again, the bottom line here at Rutgers is we are paying attention to what, what the people who have required these courses mean. Very few of our students are math majors. So what we are teaching is not really defined by the math department. It's defined by the client departments. Okay, well, again, thank you very much for your attention. And it's been a pleasure to meet all of the people who are working with us at Scott. And, um, Great to meet you. Thanks so much. <laughs> Hi, Dr. Carter. Thank you so much for the wonderful presentation. I know Rutgers Mass Department is, is a service department to a lot of many, many disciplines. In your terms, client departments, like you know, science disciplines, um, business school, and of course, the STEM fields all the time at School of Engineering as well. So thank you. Um, 就是说罗格斯的数学系也许跟斯卡特的数学系也是一样的是很多别的科系的一个服务的一个项目就是说要为学习各个很多学科的学生提供一些基础教学所以说数学系如何在大一的学生里边为不同的学科提供基础教学一
<laughs> the next one to present is Dr. Dennis Hamilton from Rutgers Business School. Uh, Dr. Hamilton has taught the management courses for um, you know many students in many different countries. So Dennis, you here? Yes. Okay, great. So. All right. Uh, well, good morning to uh, administrators, colleagues, students at the uh, South China University of Technology, and good evening to my uh, administrators and colleagues here at Rutgers. Uh, my pleasure to have the opportunity to share some thoughts on pedagogy for first year students. Yes, just very quickly, uh, since joining the Rutgers faculty, I've had the uh, privilege to teach over 100 courses, over 10,000 students. Um, between that teaching experience here and my industry experience, I've taught uh, industry and seminars across 20 different countries, have taught uh, on-site in China um, courses to Chinese students, as well as teaching remotely, and then spent over 40 years in executive level roles uh, in two Fortune 50 companies with global responsibilities. So a lot of interaction in the global environment uh, with students and with business leaders. Uh, next slide, please. So I'm just gonna talk briefly about three things. What I see is challenges uh, in teaching first year students, some suggested approaches uh, that we might want to discuss, and then just a brief slide on concluding comments. Next slide, please. So I think in defining the challenges, both for the students and for faculty, there are three things that come to mind. One is the diversity of students that we have in that first year. Diversity based on the level of preparation they've had for college study, the variation in their intellectual and learning abilities, uh, differences in language skills. And as was mentioned, Rutgers has a large population of students who are not uh, first uh, language English, and differences in the expectations of the students, uh, depending on their backgrounds, their exposure to college classes or whatever. The second main thing, and particularly for Rutgers, is class sizes. So the majority of the classes that I teach to first year students have uh, between 160 to 180 students. So there is much less direct interaction with the professor than what these students are accustomed to, much more interaction with TAs, um, using recorded lectures rather than live lectures, using recitations, uh, as opposed to, again, interaction with the professor directly. And I think the third thing is they're going to encounter different pedagogical philosophies. Well, we'd like to think that all of our faculty come from a uh, consistent view in terms of the best way to teach. I think even in listening to the presentations tonight, we're, we're seeing variation in how people who are approaching teaching to students. And so one of the things is, uh, as I was pleased to see, is the emphasis on critical thinking development in a couple of the presentations. Um, dealing with ambiguity versus rules based. So, in my case, teaching management, there's no rule book. Uh, management is a practice. It's a practice that's based on dealing with um, unpredictable and inconsistent situations based on differences that exist in countries, business, and, um, the economy at any point in time, the composition of the workforce. Uh, the particular area the person is working in. And so ambiguity is the nature of management. And so it's not a rules-based model. It's not mathematics. Um, and then we encounter differences. And again, as we've discussed already, do you teach to an exam? Do you, you focus on here's the things you need to know and I'm going to teach you exactly what you're going to need to say versus are you teaching to a set of learning goals that uh, in the early presentation, I believe by uh, Professor Mao was looking at the Bloom Taxonomy and we're trying to get students to these higher levels of learning goals. So when you combine these challenges together, I think what we have for the student is a stressful environment and a confusing environment for them as they come into that first year 
experience. Uh, next slide, please. So given those challenges, what are some things we can do as faculty to address that? I, and these are some things that I try to do to help with this. The first is making a very detailed syllabus so that students understand very clearly what are the requirements and what are the expectations. What are, their, what are the expectations they can have of me and what expectations do I have of them? I also go to great lengths to make sure that the grading and the point allocations are very clear. Students are very grade conscious. Um, you know, getting to a tier one university, they've had to be grade conscious. This is part of the criteria for them to even become eligible to, to do studies. So there's this almost to their detriment overemphasis on grading and points and so on. So I make all that clear. I want to diffuse that right up front. Also very detailed schedule of classes, what they're going to do, what the assignments are, a complete list of what supports available. How do you contact these people? Everything from TAs to the professor to if you have a learning disability, where do you go for that? If you run into a personal problem during the year, how do I approach that? And finally, what I do is I require all students to complete an agreement to syllabus requirement before they can sit for the first exam. This just uh, re-emphasizes to them the importance that I place on the syllabus as sort of our contract with each other. And so I want them to understand what they've agreed to. And if they don't agree to it, to, to please ask questions. Say, what is it that you're concerned about in terms of what that syllabus does? The second thing I try to do is recognize that students are coming from a diverse background and have variable learning skills. So I try to create self-paced learning tools. So I don't lecture live because uh, for some students, I'm going to go too fast. For other students, I'm going to go too slow. There isn't too many Goldilocks in the room where it's just right. <laughs> so the reality is most students are not going to be happy if I'm doing live lecture. So my lectures are recorded uh, with PowerPoint slides. They can self-pace those, view of those lectures. My lectures and the point somebody uh, raised earlier, again, I think it was uh, Professor Mao, my lectures are in 20 minute or less blocks. So I do not have a 60 minute lecture. I create 20 minute lecture blocks. I might have two or three of those that are assigned during the course of a week. And I specifically tell them do not look at more than one at a time. Um, because I know that uh, my family gets bored if I try and talk for more than 20 minutes, I'm sure students will too. The other thing I do is really concentrate on using what I call interactive e-textbooks. What are these? These are textbooks that are designed to help students understand whether they have mastered the material or not. In essence, um, a lot of the students now are using things like Quizlets and other things. Well, the textbook, textbook manufacturers have finally gotten smart and they're creating the equivalent of this in that as the student goes through an e-book, they get asked a series of questions to confirm that they understood something. And if they don't, the, the interactive software tracks that they didn't understand that and will bring them back to that topic again and retest them until they do show a mastery of it. To me, this is more like program learning. And it, to me, is much more effective than them reading a book and then three weeks from now, they're gonna get a test on it. Or maybe in the next class, they might get a quiz on you know, two or three elements of it. Um, it's better if they under, you know, if they're not understanding what they're reading at the time they're reading it, it's better if they know that right away. The other thing I use is a pre-populated uh, learning management system with clear menus, uh, with weekly announcements that remind students of the key things they need to do, et cetera. So I believe having a well-designed learning management system, and I know, I think it was, uh, uh, QE showed some of what she's done. This is very important for students to reduce some of the confusion. I use experienced TAs. And what do I mean by that? I actually do not use PhD students or master students. I use undergraduate students who have previously taken the course. 
What I found, uh, with all due respect to PhD students, most of them have never had an intro to management course. So the concept of TAing for a course they've never had is a little bit of a problem. Uh, they're actually learning just like the students. So I'd much rather have a student who's already taken the course, did exceptionally well in the course, is one of our top students in the undergraduate program. I would prefer to have them as the uh, TA. They're stars, they're the top students. And in many cases, they're multilingual. So I'm able to use them to deal effectively with the challenges I have with uh, first year students whose uh, primary language is not English. And the last point is, and absolutely with 180 students, you may wonder how I do this. But in fact, I run five person teams. I have as many as 50, 40 to 50 teams running simultaneously in these large sections, uh, working on group projects. Management is a practice, okay? It's not a science. And to learn management, you have to apply it. So I'm strongly in support of Professor Miles' view. Uh, to get up that curve, we've got to have students take the concepts that they learn from the book, and they need to apply those concepts to management problems, to decisions, and having that discussion in a group-based format. Management is a team sport. It's not an individual sport. So they've got to learn how to make management decisions with other people. And so I literally have uh, 11 exercises over 11 weeks. They do first as individuals to the point made that students need to come prepared. They have to prepare and submit these exercises in advance. And then they come into these team-based discussions uh, that are facilitated with the TAs to reach decisions as a team based on the pre-work that they've done. Okay, with that, my last slide, please. So in summary, I would say first year of college is a very traumatic and confusing time for students, uh, presenting many challenges for the students, the professors and for administrators. How do we make sure these students are gonna be successful? They come from diverse backgrounds, preparation, skill levels and expectations. So this uh, creates a big challenge in terms of how to design courses. The large class sizes for many first year courses add to the adjustment challenge. For many students, they've never been in a class of more than 30 students in their life. And now it's easy for them to feel lost in these large courses. Inconsistent pedagogical philosophies of instructors further create confusion. They're being taught one way in one type of course, different way in another course. They're really not sure how they're supposed to learn. And so I was very, um, much in agreement with this thought of how much time do you really spend in a course just going over, here's how you learn this course, not here's the material, here's how you study and prepare to do well in this type of course. So I believe adaptive, self-paced, interactive, team-based applied learning absolutely is essential for these first year students to help them make the adjustment to mastering college level work and making sure you give them clear requirements I use an intro video, it's like eight minutes long. Students are used to watching videos, uh, so I found that's better than writing it. Give them a, a video that they can watch in eight minutes, they're more likely to do it. Well-designed learning management, experience multilingual TAs, access to available support, periodic reminders. These things will help students to overcome some of these challenges. So these are things that I try to do and have learned from this experience and uh, hopefully they might be of help. All right, thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Hamilton, for the wonderful presentation. And then, um, you know, you're truly, truly an international professor. You have taught in very international context. So thank you. Yeah. My pleasure, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Hamilton, the next presenter is Dr. Zhu from Rutgers uh, University Center for Teaching and Learning, the Center for Teaching Evaluation and Assessment Research. Hi, Chris. Hello. Uh, uh, 
Hello, um, good morning and good evening to you all. Um, it's great to be here. And I'm gonna to talk to you today about some tips from the research and the science of learning that we can apply to our introductory courses. And I was really excited to hear um, what our previous speakers have shared because I think there's been a lot of useful content, but I think most of what I've got is a little bit different today. Um, so let's get started. So here we go. Um, so first of all, um, these are four things that we know from research on how people learn that I think are useful here. The first one is that there is better retention of knowledge when new learning is linked or connected to the things that we already know. So for our introductory students, when they're coming into the classroom, we need to be able to link what they know with what we are teaching them. We need to make that connection for them, make it obvious to them. Uh, the next point is that learning is individual. So it's always going to be based on each individual who comes into the classroom, whatever they know previously, um, they're going to need to build on that knowledge to build up uh, their, their new knowledge. Um, for a student to become an expert, they're going to have to organize their knowledge. So it's not just about getting all of that content, but it's also about putting it into a framework that makes sense for them. So expert knowledge is highly organized. And finally, testing, the testing effect. Um, testing has been seen to increase retention of the content that's learned. So we have to give our students opportunities to, uh, to test themselves, to take practice tests, and then to ultimately be tested so that they can recall that knowledge. Um, so all of this has been established by research on learning, and it links to four tips that I'm gonna provide you about what we can do in our classrooms when we are meeting with our uh, introductory level students. So the very first tip I have is to activate prior knowledge of our students. So when our students come in, maybe the first day of uh, the semester or the first day of a new week, right? Figure out how we can find out what they know already and how we can remind the students of what they know. So one way to do this is to have a discussion with students. But one thing I really like, especially in a large class, is to do a quick poll. So uh, a poll question is kind of like a multiple choice question. Um, we can do it online using these tools like Zoom. You can build it in. And in a poll question, we might ask students uh, a, a short question um, to figure out whether they know the answer already. So at the very bottom, I have a picture of a poll question. What's your level of understanding of the topic? Here they can say, I'm completely green, which means they don't know anything, all the way up to I'm an expert. And so we could get their impressions of it. And we might follow that up with a multiple choice question where there's only one right answer to see whether they're actually right about what they know. And then we might have a discussion to try to figure out what they know, if the things they know are actually correct. And the reason we're doing this is because we want to figure out if there are any misconceptions that our students have. And we also want to be able to correct those misconceptions before we begin. And that's because, um, you know, we need to build on what the students already know. And so we have to figure that out ourselves. Um, and this is especially important when you're teaching one of the classes like our colleagues have been talking about so far where, you know, mathematics uh, or something like that, where students are coming in with very different levels of knowledge from the beginning. So tip one, activate that prior knowledge. Tip number two is to consider formative assessments. Formative assessments mean, so formative assessment is assessment that is really for the student's practice, it's for them to know whether they are understanding the material in real time and to get some feedback as they are going. So it allows the instructor to engage, to gauge or to judge the student's understanding as we go. Uh, so one of my favorite ways to do this is what we call an exit ticket. So an exit ticket is at the very end of a class period, uh, I might give a student one or two questions and say, you're not allowed to leave until you write the answers to these two questions. And those questions might be, you know, what was the most interesting thing you learned? And what was the answer to this challenging question? And what we can do with these is we can determine where they're at 
and we can realize we can determine if we need to go back and provide extra extra um, lessons maybe the next day. But also we can tell the students, actually, you're not quite right there, right? You actually missed something early on. Formative assessment is usually very low points, right? Maybe it's just complete or incomplete for a grade. Um, and that's, so it encourages students not to be very stressed about what they're doing, um, but it gives them that opportunity to know whether they are actually learning. And then we can provide additional resources to address the gaps that might exist. So if I give a lecture and a lot of the students in the end don't fully understand it, I might realize I need to go back and make a video or, uh, or give an additional reading so that the students can ca catch up. Number three, and we talked about the testing effect, is consider short, frequent summative assessments. So summative assessments are those moments where we actually um, give a students a chance to prove what they have learned and to, uh, to, to show that they have mastered the material. So frequent either low stakes quizzes or tests can help the students metacognition or their ability to put together these pieces of knowledge. And you need to have those summative assessments. However, on the other hand, um, if you have just one big exam at the end of a class, students might not realize that they have been falling behind or that they missed some critical content as you've gone along. So we recommend that you break up those classes into, or those tests, those exams into shorter, uh, shorter tests um, to give students a chance to practice recalling that material as you go through the semester. All right, and number four is to help students to organize the knowledge. And so we had a, a speaker uh, a little while ago who was talking about the mind maps. And I love that, the mind map and the examples from the film study class. Um, and that's exactly what we would recommend. Um, so how can we get students to connect the knowledge that they have so that they can uh, put it together in their minds and so that it will stick and they'll be able to retain that knowledge better? And one way that we like is a concept map, which is, I think, very similar to the mind map that we looked at earlier. A concept map is where you have students um, draw out a map and connect all the things they have learned. This is particularly useful if you're reviewing what you've been teaching for the course of a few weeks. Um, have students draw that map and make all of those connections. Um, now, concept maps and mind maps, they work best when you give feedback on them. So it's not just an activity that you have students do on their own, but something that you should collect or at least stop by and tell them where they've made the right connections and where some of those connections could use improvement. So those are the four tips I've got for you. And um, I, I think that was a little bit quick, but I'm getting, uh, getting tired tonight. So I, I hope, you've, uh, hope you found this useful. And I do have some uh, references here where I've found this information. So uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Drew. Uh, you know, you have helped many, many instructors there, Braggers. So um, now I'm opening up the floor for questions and discussion. Uh,现在是大家的提问与讨论时间。根据数学系的Dr.Carlin,还有管理学教学的Dr.Hamilton,还有教学研究中心的Dr.Drew的发言,大家有什么样的问题? 可以放到Chatbox里边,也可以unmute你们的,也可以打开麦克风去接近提问。嗯。对。Any uh, the major is not mathematics, but engineering uh, or physics. Uh. Thank you, Raj. Thank you. Eric, you're on mute. Yeah, thank, thank you very much for the question. Yeah, this, this is a, a 
important concern of ours is how to teach students how to teach uh, how to study effectively. And we have more and more students who, you know, complain, oh, I did lots, lots and lots of work. And, you know, I, I, I put in the work, but I didn't get a good grade. I didn't get a good result. You know, I, I've talked with many of these students. And I mean, one, one thing that seems to work for a number of them is to try and, you know, tell them to classify problems when you're working practice problems, you know, put them into groups. You, you know, in, in, in research, many of us work from examples. Ah, oh, this, this, this looks something like that. You know, this is how you solve a problem. And I, we've had success with many students telling them, well, you know, when you solve a problem, talk about it with your friends. First form study groups. I should have said that maybe first of all. I mean, you know, and this came up in, in I think, uh, Professor Mao's talk. I mean, the study groups explaining things to each other is extremely important for learning. So this is this. They should really, and we have a big program at Rutgers to encourage students to facilitate the formation of study groups because online it's much harder than when we had classes live. Okay, so study groups, good. Then, but okay, when you finally solve a problem and you look it up in the back of the book and you see the answer is right, I mean, don't stop there. That's not the main point. I mean, the, the, we have to tell the students to analyze what other problems did this look like? What, what problem have you seen that's most is like this problem? Why was it like that problem? You know, how can you recognize, you know, what made it click and try to recognize next time when you see a problem where that idea made the problem click, how can you recognize that? So, you know, just doing this taxonomy, sorting out the problems. I mean, this is the thing, you know, we are making up a calculus exam you know, if you well, what is this problem? That but they, they all problems all look the same. You you do these things with students, and they all look different. I mean, I've taught probability theory classes, and you have problems about pulling shoes out of a closet and socks out of a drawer, and we think we're just changing the words, and for them they look entirely different. These problems, so one has to get them to recognize. You know, they really have to think about the problems and recognize which problems are. The same as so you walk through the forest, all the leaves look different at first, but at some point you recognize that's a maple leaf, that's an oak leaf. I mean, getting them to do this taxonomy seems to help. Having them do group work and explain things to each other is, is so important. But the, the most important thing is at the end of the day, when they've solved a problem, you know, not just to look in the back of the book and see, oh, I got it right, but to ask themselves, how do I know my answer made sense? And before they look in the back of the book, they should ask themselves, how do I know my answer made sense? I think these are some of the most important things. You know, talking to students who have been having trouble and we tell them to try these steps and they seem to do better. Yeah, so uh, uh, solving problems in the group discussion, uh, most important, okay? Well, I, I think having a study group is just so important. I mean, explaining things to each other, and this came up in, in, in the earlier talks, that, you know, explaining things is important. And we do this, too, in the, in the workshops we have. We require students to go up to the Blackboard and explain a problem to their colleagues. And there's a, a, usually a graduate student who's doing the recitation section for these classes. And, you know, they don't criticize or do anything. They, they moderate the discussion and they ask the other students, okay, are you convinced? Is something wrong with this? And, you know, this kind of back and forth really gets students ready to go on to the next courses in mathematics, which requires them to write down proofs and do things like that. But, but most important, it gets them ready to say, well, is this right or is it wrong without looking in the back of the book? I mean, doing it by discussion among themselves, do we know this is right? Then look in the back of the book. You know, if, if they get to that point, they've learned, they have achieved what we are trying to teach them to do. Thank, right, thank you. you. Uh, we, thank have you. Another, we have another question from the audience that is raised to all of the professors who are presented here. If we add, uh, you know, during the lecture time, if we increase the discussion time, or group study time, or drill, even drills in the practice time, how do we make sure the content of the course can be covered uh, during the lecture time at the same time of adding these interactive components? 就是说在课堂中如果增加讨论分组或者做题的环节,如何保证课堂内容可以在授课学习正常完成呢? This is for all the presenters here. Mm -hmm. Can you take a, a shot at that? I'm, 
a part of it is maybe philosophically how you want to handle lectures. So in my case, uh, my courses are designed to be hybrid courses. And all the lecture is recorded and online, and students do it at a self-paced rate. All of my in-class sessions are all devoted to team-based exercises, highly interactive. Um, I might do a few comments at the beginning to just set up the exercise and put it in context. But the rest of the time they're working in groups, working with the TAs and myself, interacting to make sure that the teams are engaged in meaningful discussion uh, and so on. So this way, there's no confusion. The times are pre-blocked out. Lectures, again, in those small bites, uh, maybe three uh, small bite lectures they need to complete each week before they come to the live class session. And then those live sessions, I'm doing quizzes on the lectures to make sure also trying to use books where they, to uh, um, Chris's point, um, it's better for them to test whether they're learning the stuff real time, not waiting, you know, a week or even three weeks or four weeks. It's better if they're finding out right away, have they really learned this or not? Um, so I think uh, having uh, these interactive learning tools uh, as opposed to go read a textbook and then come to class type of thing. So those would be my suggestions uh, for how to um, make sure you get all the content. So I know I've got all the content in, during the lecture piece and in the assigned readings, and then I'm able to fully dedicate live class sessions to that interactive model um, so that when they're in the classroom, they are busy the whole time. The, the noise level in that classroom with 180 students is, is uh, pretty impressive. So that would be my suggestion. Thank you. Uh, in, in mathematics, I, I would say for a long time, we, well, we have the advantage that we have this, the calculus classes are four credit courses and there are two lectures a week, 80 minutes and one 80 minute recitation. And so we had for many years focused most of the active learning efforts on the rest uh, the workshops and recitations. Those are the lectures which have maybe 90 students in a Math 135 class, maybe 75 and one for the engineering. These are, were for a long time considered too large to do active learning stuff in. So we, we focused the active learning efforts on what was going on in, in the workshops. Okay. But, you know, people are pushing the envelope and it's people are trying more and more techniques where you assign the students to watch some videos beforehand, maybe take a quiz and familiarize themselves with some of the stuff you might do with the sage on the stage techniques and you know just watch that first and come into the class and and free up some class time to do it so pushing some of the stuff outside the class a little bit for it gives the students more structured study and, and you know as we discussed before many students spend lots of hours studying but they you know highlight the text and do all kinds of non-productive things you know one one of the advantages of doing a sort of flipped classroom approach is you give them assignments, you structure what they're doing outside of the class and make it productive. And we have at Rutgers now a learning assistant program. The learning center provides learning assistants, which can be deployed in lectures too, because otherwise, you know, one lecture with you know, 90, 75 students, it's impossible. But we're doing more things with polls. Polls were mentioned, I think, in Professor Mao's talk, one of the, one of the talks earlier. So polls, interactive things, little mini quizzes and so forth. And so our lectures are getting more interactive too. And I, I think it's a good way to go. We're learning how to do it. I, can, I will not presume to tell, to tell anyone here what is the state of the art, but, you know, it, it does seem to be working for us and making the lectures more interactive. The limitations on the attention span have been mentioned many times. And you know, at Rutgers, especially, this is a problem. We're in a very spread out campus. We have our classes meet twice a week instead of three times a week. We have 80 minute lectures twice a week instead of three 45 minute lectures, which I had at every other, else, other place I've taught. This is beyond the attention span of many students. But we're learning to work with this better and better. Um, yeah. Thank you. Uh, 
all of these questions and answers will be transcribed and translated later. You know, this is a recorded session. So, so today, given the 所有问题呢，我们都会啊、呃、用打字的形式打出来，而且翻译成双语的形式，在几天之后分享给大家。I have another question from the audience. Can someone introduce how the e-textbooks are interacting with our students? How e-textbooks? 能具体介绍一下电子教材与学生的互动吗 ？Interaction between e-textbooks and students. So I think I was the one who brought this up. The、um, I've actually written a textbook for my course and、uh, work with a group that creates、um, a tool that the student uses. So as they're going through、um, reading the e-book online,、uh, this tool proactively will periodically ask them questions about what they've read to assess whether they've actually learned it. So again, this was Chris's. Model again. the way it's learning is more effective is if you're constantly、um, asking the student to reflect on what they've done、uh, to assess whether they've actually understood what they've read or and so on. And so,、um, in using eBooks, you have the ability to use this interactive software in connection with the eBook. That will allow those features to be incorporated into it. So,、uh, again, to Chris's point, if you look at where most of the advanced learning modules are going, it's going towards this interactive type of model of learning, as opposed to just simply、um, telling someone to read something, leaving it to them to assess whether they've mastered that or not.、Um, I think that's kind of an old. Version of how this is done. It's same with lectures. I mean,、uh, I wish we could, in, in essence, accomplish the same thing with the lecture, where、uh, if we have an interactive software tool where we would lecture, it would pause at some point, assess the students' understanding, and allow them to continue. So I think by doing recorded lectures, we can get there. I mean, this is I've sort of challenged my publisher to say, why can't we do the same thing with lectures that we're doing with the textbook? Because I think this would really give us the highest level of、uh, success with students getting the most out of reading and out of lectures. So those would be my comments. There, McGraw Hill has something they call Connect.、Um, I don't work with McGraw Hill. I have a different publisher,、uh, but it's the tool is very similar to the McGraw Hill tool. So if you're using any of the McGraw Hill books、uh, and you're familiar with Connect. It's that sort of a tool、uh, that does this sort of thing. Thank you. Any other questions from the audience?、Uh, maybe I'll、oh, add one more comment to on, on that question. Is that you know I, I mentioned earlier that in during the pandemic we've been moving to more conceptual questions in mathematics. And many of the textbooks are still set up for the old, you know, the an old model where people were. Many of the problems can be solved by rote computation. If you open up a standard calculus textbook, you can type most of the problems into Wolfram Alpha or whatever, and solve them without any understanding at all. And of course, these are not things we are asking right now. So there has been a lot of pushback from students. Okay, the questions you are asking on the test do not look like. Any of the problems in the textbook, and of course that means we are putting up lots of more materials, study guides with with the kinds of problems we're going to ask on the text on the tests. But there's a push also at Rutgers now to create open source textbooks, and we're doing this starting with the differential equations class. We have a class where we're, we're creating someone has got a project to create. From an open source text to create a textbook, and we'll have the kind of problems we're asking these days. And so, I, th I think a lot, lot of things will be changing going forward. But yes, we're looking forward. We, we are looking towards making sure the textbooks really match our goals in teaching for the students. And many of the mass market textbooks are not quite so well matched to what we're doing right now. So we will probably be making more of our own. Okay, thank you, Doctor、uh, Carlin. Rick, you have a question? No. Wait, may I have a question? Yes, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, I,、uh, yeah, I want to have a question to the Professor Chris Stu. 
May I have a question with you? Yes. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Uh, just now, I really very deep impressed by your presentation, and I observe a word is the informative assess assessment, right? So I want to uh, ask that is um, uh, that because that is also a very interesting in the center student centered teaching mode. That is how to reasonable to evaluate the student performance. So I want to uh, ask you that is. Uh, what is the possible way or format in the informative assessment and how to uh, utilize them to reasonably or scientifically reflect a student performance? Hmm. Yeah, so there's so two types of assessment, right? We have formative assessment and summative assessment. And typically we want to have a mix of both of these types of assessment um, in the classes that we're teaching. And um, often what you can do is have formative assessment where this is where students, once again, they are practicing this content, practicing demonstrating their knowledge. And you can see, you could actually um, see how well your students are doing on those particular items, uh, each quiz question or each uh, question you've asked, and you can compare it to how they do on the summative assessment, the sort of bigger tests that are coming up. And so we can see whether students maybe have forgotten some of that content. Maybe they knew it the day that they learned the material, that day they understood it, and maybe they forgot it. And that might mean that they didn't practice it, right? They went home and they completely forgot and they moved on to the next subject. And that might mean we need to build in more opportunities for them to practice and refresh their knowledge. Um, but, um, but I mean, uh, ultimately, I think it's important to have that blend, to blend together and have both of these types of assessment recurring throughout the, um, throughout the class. Um, does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Very interesting. Thank you very much. Sure. Yep. Um, summative assessment, summative assessment. <laughs> we can have more discussion on this later on um, one. Um, we will share the transcript text to everyone here. So, um, okay. If no other questions, let's welcome Jeff Wang uh, from Rutgers to do the concluding remarks. Hi, Jeff. Hi, good morning uh, for friends and colleagues uh, in China and good, e good evening friends uh, and colleagues at, uh, in the US. Um, first and foremost, uh, I really want to express my appreciation uh, to the speakers and the panelists for uh, your very uh, valuable contributions to this pedagogy seminar. Uh, uh, my sorry, deepest uh, gratitude. Jeff, uh, just pause after two more sentences. Dory is ready to do the translation. Sorry, Jeff. Uh, thank you, 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 uh, from uh, other institutions to attend this um, discussion and help make uh, this event successful. Uh, we all know teaching first year college course is a critical element uh, for student success. And they are making the transition from a high school student to college students. 教授大学一年级课程是学生成功的关键因素，因为他们正在从高中过渡到大学。So hearing and learning from the speakers today has educated uh, all of us here on the challenges and solutions in the first year instruction. 所以今天的演讲者、小组成员以及听众，你们的聆听还有学习，让我们在我们的第一年教学中，然后我们知道我们的挑战，还有我们的解决方法、解决方法。I guess we all know that it's critically important to hear different views from uh, different universities, in particular in today's context, the schools and the very different national higher education system, like you know, the system between the US and China. Um, um, this comparative perspective will help us to have a better understanding of first year uh, course instruction. Uh, 
So I'm certain that uh, today, the takeaways from the discussion will further deepen in our thinking and uh, uh, maybe uh, stimulate our even more successful teaching works for the future. So I believe this discussion will further deepen our thinking and stimulate our even more successful teaching works for the future. So I believe this discussion As Vice President、uh, Li Weiqing and Vice President Eric Garfinkel stated at the beginning of the panel discussion, we both value the long and the robust relationship between the two schools. 正如副主席李卫青还有副主席 Eric Garfinkel 所说，我们都重视我们两所学校之间长期而牢固的关系。The, the webinar today shows our commitment for global learning and student success.、Uh, I think it's particularly meaningful. As we all witness the rise of anti-globalization and anti-free、uh, flow of people and knowledge in our time. Today's online webinar shows our commitment to global learning and student success, especially in the era of anti-globalization and anti-free flow of people and knowledge in our time. This is particularly meaningful. So, building on today's successful event,、uh, we are going to look forward. To more collaboratives and initiatives, both in online and on-site format, such as the,、uh, the the recently signed collaborative education accord、uh, between the two schools, additional double degree programs, and maybe study abroad exchange, etc. So, 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 然后我们可能也会有额外的双学位课程出国留学交出国留学交流的。I also want to thank the participants from、uh, other schools who are present today, and we equally look forward to working with you in the future. 我也要感谢今天在场的其他学校的参与者，我们同样期待着与您们合作。Finally, I would really want to、uh, convey a special thanks for our interpreter,、uh, Fu Ri. Who have been extremely professional in facilitating facilitating the discussion today. 最后，我要特别感谢口译人员，他在促进今天讨论方面非常专业。Again, thanks everyone、uh, making this pedagogy discussion successful. Good morning or good night to you all. 好，再次感谢大家使用呃我们我们的，再次感谢大家大家来我们的教学方法讨论。然后呃，大家早上好，还有晚上好。好的。谢谢大家今天的研讨会。呃、uh, ，最后我也想说一句，罗根斯这方面也邀请了我们合作院校上海大学的李老师来参与我们的会议啊。谢谢李老师，谢谢上海大学的参与。好的，谢谢大家，今天的研讨会就此结束。我们以后会有后续的工作，呃，把呃一些相关的材料发给大家。Thank you everyone. The webinar is、uh, over for today, but we'll send you more follow-up materials in a few days after today's event. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Good evening and good night.